comparing the cell mediated, mediated immune response with antibody mediated immune response is really helpful because it helps you see where they differ from one another and what key roles each of these two specific immune responses play. In antibody mediated immunity, the key player is the B cell. That by far and away is the most critical player, but we're going to see that we have to also have helper T cells involved once again for the same reason as previously. We need to have somebody confirm that the B cell is right, that there really is an infection or a problem. Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Similar to the cell mediated response, there are three sort of phases or key sequences that happen in an antibody mediated response. Those are recognition, attack, and memory. Um, the other key player aside from B cells and helper T cells are we have memory B cells that are made. We have a specialized type of B cell called a plasma cell whose job it is to do nothing more than make millions of copies of antibodies very fast. And we have to have the presence of free-floating antigens from whatever agent has been infecting us. During the recognition phase, uh, this is a time during which B cells are located throughout the body in, in lots, pr principally in places like payer patches and lymph nodes, et cetera, and other mucosal associated lymphatic tissues. And they are there monitoring the, the fluid moving by them. And what they're looking for is free floating antigens, principally. Now remember I told you before, B cells, to become immunocompetent, each B cell begins to manufacture a uniquely shaped antibody on its surface and that no two B cells have the shape, same shaped antibody on their surface. So they are unique. They have what unique, what are called uh, antibodies or BCRs, B cell receptors on their surface, just like the uh, T cells had uniquely shaped T cell receptors on their surface. And each one of these responds to only one shaped type of antigen. So we've got these millions of differently shaped uh, B cells floating around. They are monitoring the fluid moving past them. They're looking at any types of potential antigens that are floating around. And if they uh, identify a free-floating antigen, they will, so here's an antigen right here, they will endocytose it. They will pull it in, okay? First, so they get it to stick to the, to the surface of their plasma membrane. That's called capping. And then they pull it in through endocytosis. They uh, fuse it with a lysosome. To, in order to digest that antigen into little bits and pieces. And then they install it in an MHC2 protein. Okay, so here's my MHC2 protein. Here's the antigen present in that MHC2 protein. And just like any other antigen presenting cell, when that B cell finds an antigen and presents it in its MHC2, it sends out interleukin 1 to call nearby helper T cells to come check it out. <clears throat> so you'll get a mob of helper T cells that all rush over to come and check out the shape of the antigen being presented in the MHC2. Again, this will take hours, but eventually we should finally come across the right shaped helper T cell that has uh, the correctly shaped TCR or T cell receptor on its surface that's able to recognize and bind to that particularly shaped antigen. Okay, at that point, this helper T cell, remember, is going to uh, secrete some substances. Um, before, we said it secreted interleukin-2, and it still does that because that helps to stimulate um, the cytotoxic T cells. Remember, the whole cell-mediated response is happening simultaneous to this response. So it's secreting interleukin-2 to stimulate cytotoxic T cells to divide, but it also secretes interleukin-4 and interleukin-5. And interleukin-4 and 5 in particular are very good at stimulating this particular B cell to clone. Now, the reason why this B cell is the only one to clone is because this B cell was the only one that had the right shaped antibody on its surface that that antigen bound to. Okay, so just because there's an antigen floating by a B cell doesn't mean that B cell is going to respond to it. That antigen has to be shaped correctly to fit into the immunoglobin D on the surface of that B cell. If that happens, 
through that process of, of um, endocytosis and then display. And then once we get the helper T cells to confirm that, yes, there really is an infection happening, you have found the antigen B cell and you are the right shaped B cell to recognize this antigen. At that point, the release of the interleukin 4 and 5 allow for clonal selection or the massive production of B cells that are the same as this B cell. When that happens, when I make a massive amount of B cells, lots and lots of clones of this correctly shaped B cell, those B cells that are copies um, change, they transform, and they produce huge amounts of rough endoplasmic reticulum. When they produce rough endoplasmic reticulum in large amounts, it's because the rough endoplasmic reticulum is really good at manufacturing proteins that are intended to be exported out of a cell. In this case, think about it. We want to manufacture a protein to be exported out of the cell. That protein is called an antibody. The plasma cells um, are going to manufacture huge quantities of antibody, and they're going to throw out millions of copies of antibody every minute. And they're going to put those into the bloodstream. Those antibodies we know are going to be properly shaped to bind to the antigen that's floating around. So during, this is where we get to the attack phase. Once I have all those plasma cells, all those copies of the B cell, the plasma cells are putting out millions of copies of immunoglobin, and they put out specifically immunoglobin M. Remember, that's that pentamer-shaped version, M for mega. This is, it's good to have a, a, a big uh, pentamer-shaped thing because it means I have lots of binding sites to bind lots of free-floating antigen. Remember, again, just like with cell-mediated immunity, this process takes a few days. It takes a few days to find the right-shaped B cell that has the right-shaped antibody on its surface to interact with the antigen. Then it has to endocytose, digest, and present that antigen. It has to secrete interleukin-1 to call over the helper T cells. The helper T cells have to figure out which among them is the right-shaped helper T cell for the job. Then they secrete interleukins 2, 4, and 5. That causes the cloning of the B cell. Mitosis takes a while, takes a couple days to manufacture enough plasma cells. And then those plasma cells have to take some time to begin um, making the massive quantities of antibodies. So by the time all those events have happened, you're three to five days out from the time of exposure to the um, antigen. That, that bacterial infection or whatever it might be has had a long time to gain a hold in your body. So to combat that, we produce lots of immunoglobin Ms. These guys have lots of point of binding with antigen, presumably because there's a lot of antigen in the body and we want to clean it out pretty rapidly. So there's a number of different ways in which an antibody can incapacitate an antigen. There's a lot of different ways, in other words, that an antibody can get rid of an antigen from your body. One is through a process called neutralization. Some books call it inactivation. It means the same thing. Really what we're doing here is the antibody is binding to the antigen and doing so in such a manner that any harmful qualities that that antigen had are neutralized. So the antigen can no longer harm cells. We can also undergo a process called agglutination. And you'll remember from our discussion of blood transfusion reactions that agglutination is when a bunch of antigens and a bunch of antibodies all clump together in a large group, like you see here. Uh, once we have agglutination occur, then usually what happens is a macrophage will come by later and will consume that mass and get rid of it. Another op uh, option is we can have what's called complement fixation. And that means that as soon as an antibody binds to an antigen, there are other binding sites on that antigen uh, down here that allow for the binding of complement proteins. And that sets off that whole complement cascade. And the complement cascade can do things like induce inflammation. It can promote chemotaxis so that neutrophils and macrophages come to the area and check things out. Uh, it can also encourage the lysis of bacterial cells that might be nearby. The last option is, and they didn't do an illustration of this here, but you can imagine this because you've had chemistry classes. Um, you can take a soluble antigen, something that's dissolved, 
in fluid and by having an antibody attached to it you can cause it to precipitate out of solution as a solid so that antigen is no longer dissolved in solution and once it becomes a precipitate once it becomes solid it can easily be identified by a macrophage or neutrophil and then consumed um, so macrophages come into play to do lots of, of consumption or destruction. It turns out eosinophils can also help with the destruction of the antibody antigen complex. And um, there are some T cells that can be involved in that process as well. But principally, it's macrophages that do the brunt of the work. I told you previously, I talked to you about the difference between primary and secondary immune responses. Um, that, has to, that also uh, relates directly to the generation of all of these memory, bees, uh, memory cells. Remember during the cell-mediated response, we made a lot of clones of the cytotoxic T cell. We called those memory T cells and spread them throughout the body. We also, during the cloning process, when we were making all those plasma cells, we also made a bunch of memory cells. And those memory B cells were not made to instantly start making antibody. They were like the memory T cells, meant to be spread throughout the body and just put in reserve to just wait it out until the next time we ever encounter this bacterium again, we can have those memory B cells immediately begin to produce massive quantities of antibodies. So here's what that looks like. If we look at a primary immune response, this is by definition the first time you are exposed to a particular pathogen, a bacterium, or whatever it is. And you'll notice that um, if we measure the number of antibodies present in the blood serum, that's called antibody titer, when we measure the number of antibodies present in blood serum, that the antibody titer doesn't even appear for the first time until about three days out from the time of infection. And remember, again, that's because we have all those complex steps involved in finding the right-shaped B cell, the right-shaped helper T cell, uh, making clones, making antibodies. All of that takes time. So we don't even first start producing immunoglobin Ms until about the third or fourth day out after infection. But then we can see that there's a quick rise in the number of immunoglobin Ms present. We also get some production of immunoglobin Gs by those plasma cells, but that doesn't usually kick in until a few days later. And you can see that um, given some time, the number of antibodies against that particular infectious agent climb um, with time. Now let's imagine then three months later, you are exposed to the same bacterium again. Because there are memory B cells present, and by the way, there are, don't forget, there's also memory T cells although they don't get involved in antibody manufacture, but they are out there. Because you have those memory B cells that you made previously, now look at what happens. The moment that you encounter that infection, right at time zero, your body begins to, those, those, those memory B cells begin to secrete massive, massive amounts of immunoglobin G and smaller amounts of immunoglobin M. Because we're able to have so many cells already produce hundreds of thousands of them throughout the body. They're ready to go and they can produce um, uh, antibodies immediately and release them into the blood. The, um, any type of the antigen that's present is going to immediately be bonded to by the antibodies and cleared from your system. <clears throat> but the result is, is on your second exposure or during a secondary immune response, you almost never experience symptoms. It just, the agent gets cleared from your body so quickly you don't even know you were exposed. And it's not just because of the massive amount of, of um, antibodies being produced, but it's also because, remember, we've got all these memory T cells and they go out immediately and kill any cells that have become infected in the body and get them cleared immediately from the body. So, a uh, pretty complex series of interactions that I've discussed here. I want to tell you something, though. The version that I've given you is an incredibly simplified version of the cell-mediated and antibody-mediated responses. The compounds, the chemicals involved, the types of cells involved, the interactions involved is, is far more complicated than I've led on here. You can take entire immunology classes where all you do is look into this stuff for the better part of an entire semester. So I know you might think this is complicated, and it is, but you've really only seen the very simplified version of complicated. Um, the immune response is, is a very eloquent piece of machinery that keeps us safe from an, our environment.
uh, in and amongst all of that, I hope you notice that there was a common theme running through here, which is that we had to have a helper T cell present for both t um, the cell mediated response and for the uh, antibody mediated response. And the role of the helper T cell in both instances was to serve as a con confirmation step. Until a, a, a helper T cell confirms the infection, neither B cells nor T cells will be allowed to clone. So really, the one cell you absolutely cannot do without in the specific immune response are those helper T cells. We're going to see uh, in the next part of this lecture when I start talking immune, about immune system disorders that the reason why HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, is such a uh, devastating viral infection is because the HIV virus targets helper T cells specifically. And when it does that, it basically takes down the entire specific immune response.